you about uh, creating D3 components uh, and switching to Angular 2. You can um, follow the slides at ng-vegas D3 um, bit.ly. So if you don't know about it, D3 is a very cool JavaScript library that allows you to um, um, manipulate the uh, DOM based on your data. It is, it, ha it is a collection of helper functions that you can use. Um, so why would you want to use it with Angular? The reason is D3 is not a plug and play library, graph library. You have to create your own graphs every time. So instead of doing that, you can encapsulate your um, visualization inside Angular directives and you can reuse it with any kind of data anywhere in your application. You can also take advantage of uh, Angular's interactivity and data bindings. So uh, how do we do it in an Angular way? Uh, first off, all of your logic and D3 code has to be inside uh, your directive definition. You can use your uh, declarative HTML syntax to uh, feed the data to your um, directive instance. Uh, that way you can keep your data inside a service and a controller, uh, which is a nice separation. Another cool use of D3 and Angular together is creating your own filters. So uh, D3 has a lot of um, methods for um, formatting and manipulating the data, and um, it is really helpful to have it inside an Angular filter. So we declare <coughs> uh, uh, our components and um, bind the data through the attributes. Here we have the bind data attribute. Uh, this is how it looks in Angular 1, and it will, it will look the same in Angular 2. So no worries there. This is also how it can look. So my point being, you can uh, use a lot of uh, attributes to um, customize your graphs. This is a really cool um, thing to do because then you can give it to your designers or whoever and um, it's very easy for the end user to customize your visualizations. Don't forget to use the uh, uh, native Angular directives like ng-repeat. It's super useful and take advantage of the uh, isolate scope. So um, how we define it. Our linking function is basically our constructor function. All of our D3 um, code goes into our uh, linking function. But our linking function doesn't have to know anything about our data. It should actually not know anything about our data, but it assumes a sort of data. The way we bind the data is through our scope options. Uh, here you can see we bind the, um, bind the data uh, with the two-way data binding, and you can bind other attributes to be used to customize your graphs. Um, you can use the strings and you can use the um, expressions to be evaluated in runtime. Oh. Let's take a look at a live example that actually works. Let's see if I can do this. All right. So here's our bar graph um, added to our HTML. And uh, graph data is. Um, uh, bound to the data in our scope. And this is how we define it in our directive. And for our linking function, uh, the main difference between using uh, regular D3 with uh, plain JavaScript versus um, with Angular, you actually have to select the uh, zeroth element instead of any element in your uh, document. So this gives you the entering point. Once you have your selection, you want to bind the data to it, and it's a really good idea to do it inside an encapsulated um, function, like a render function or an update function. That way, you can take advantage of um, scope.watch, and anytime there is a change in your data, um, you can re-render your um, graphs. So here, we can add more data, and then it automatically updates everything because we are watching it on the scope. Um, so, okay, nice. So enter and exit is 
the most confusing concepts for the new beginners. And it's actually very close to the, uh, what watch function is doing. Uh, watch function is watching for the data changes, um, but enter and exit is doing the actual selection, uh, removing and appending to the data. Whenever we have some extra data, we are creating new elements to add to our DOM, and whenever we have less data, we just exit and remove it. So we have a couple of ways to access our data. Uh, D3 comes with a bunch of functions, most popular being D2.json and D2.csv. Uh, these all work like any other HTTP calls. Um, but one thing that you should be careful of, if you're using these methods from a D3 library, you have to watch uh, your data in your controller as well. You can use HTTP methods instead, uh, so Angular will be smarter about uh, the data changes. So the truth about data, as you can imagine, data is never in the format that you're looking for. Uh, it's rarely ever a um, single uh, array. So um, in this example, uh, what we need is a nested array and that's what we have in our ah, controller here. Um, so there are a few ways to approach this. Once you have your data from your API, you can um, manipulate it and put it in the uh, format that you want in the servers and in your controller. Uh, but also, um, it is, it, and also you can take advantage of the array functions that comes with D3, and there, there are a lot of them. But a better way of doing it is um, using accessor functions in your controllers. So the thing that it's doing is um, you don't actually have to know uh, where your data will be uh, in your uh, data structure, but you can define it in your controller and uh, bind it to your attributes. So here when it comes um, as you might you remember in our um, bar graph here, we used to have just a uh, string of, um, I mean, array of integers, but here we have an array of objects with, with the values that we need. Instead of uh, defining um, data.value in our um, directive description and using it, the a better way of using it is um, defining the scope that accessor function here in our um, HTML. And then, uh, so instead of the uh, regular datum, we are just passing it through uh, the scope that accessor function. So, If you had any doubts about using TypeScript, uh, you might appreciate it if you're doing any data visualizations because any other um, uh, application might deal with uh, some um, not having the right type of data at some point. But uh, if you have only one data point that is not the type that you're expecting, your whole graph won't be rendering. So there, uh, a, there's an easy way today to use um, TypeScript with Angular you can uh, include the definitely typed, type definitions from, for JavaScript um, and start using it today. And you don't have to go all the way uh, TypeScript. You can just use the uh, type definitions or anything that you like. So uh, don't be fooled from, with, with my uh, simple examples. There are so many cool stuff that you can do, and there's tons of examples on uh, the D3 website, uh, and there's so many code out there. So go and explore and create cool things. Thank you. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, it's, it's like half the talk. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Now I'm going to talk to you guys about um, converting your D3 examples that we just wrote today to Angular 2. And what we're going to accomplish is this right here. Now, this is Angular 2, and you may or may not know the syntax here, but essentially we have the app component, and inside of there we have our bar graph, the one that we 
we wrote, and inside of it we see our little bars here. Now, in Angular 1, we're going to achieve the exact same syntax um, for that, having a top-level app component, bar graph, and little bars there. And you can see the attributes are exact same for Angular 1 and Angular 2, and that's what we're going to do today. Now, the thing about Angular 2 is that there's a f quite a few concepts uh, that transfers over from Angular 1. And to start off, let's do uh, IO dependencies. So the very top level over AppJS, we include our app dependencies. And since it's Angular 1, we're going to use script tags in the index file. So that's commented out here. Um, the second one is creating our top level app component, our top level app module. And inside of there, that allows us to, uh, allows Angular to create its dependency injection. And in there, we're going to register our uh, directive and uh, we're going to name it bar graph, and that's a way for uh, the Angular's compiler to select the elements inside of our template in order to attach our behavior. And below that, we have our directive definition object, and this is, uh, again, another way to attach metadata uh, to our behavior in order for our Angular's compiler to determine the intent of our, of our code. And with that, we're uh, using scope, and we're uh, binding to the data attribute uh, right here. And this is our uh, behavior. And this is a function for bar graph. And you can see that uh, with using a linking function, and uh, the first argument is scope, second argument is elements. And what we're going to do is we're going to get the reference to the HTML element directly, um, grabbing that as EL, wrapping it in D3, then building out our uh, elements to be rendered. And then we're creating a render uh, function. And we're doing this in order to re-render the component whenever there's new data. So you can see here, it's, if there's new data, then re-render. And uh, in order to determine whether or not we have new data, we have to watch their current scope. And we're checking um, if data has changed. And if there is, we're going to re-render this function uh, as such. And in order for all that to work, we have to attach data to our uh, component. right? So, uh, or directive. So, um, we do this with the app controller, and we define an array with values, and we attach uh, graph data to our scope. Now, if you look at the HTML, we can see that right here. We have our graph data, we're being passed to uh, bind.data, and we have other attributes that we could attach to, and we can see our app controller here, right? Now, I'm going to show you the same exact thing, but in Angular 2. This could work. Now, um, as I noticed, uh, noted before, the top, at the very top of our app, we're going to specify our I/O dependencies. Now, um, in Angular 1, we did this with script tags, so that's why it's not in our JavaScript. But uh, in Angular 2, we're able to take advantage of ES6 modules and use the import statements here. Now, um, we also need to specify uh, metadata for our for Angular 2's compiler to know the intent of our behavior. So we do this by annotating our class, um, uh, specifying directives. This is similar to Angular 1. And inside of it, we're doing the exact same thing, and that is specifying a selector. This is for Angular's compiler to determine where uh, in the template it should attach their behavior to. And we're specifying properties to bind. This is the same thing with bind data. And then below, rather than um, using functions, uh, we could take advantage of ES6 again and use a class. Um, and in there, we're going to inject our element, similar to um, Angular 1, where we have our elements injected. And the exact same thing, uh, we're going to, oh wait, I can just do this. Uh, we're going to inject, we're going to get a reference to the, the element directly. We're going to wrap that in D3, just as we did in the other one. We're going to build our object to be rendered again. And we're going to create a render method on our class. And this is the exact same code as Angular 1, where we're um, determining if there's new data and re-rendering the component as such. And now there's, we're going to also take advantage of a new feature in, in Angular 2, and that's the lifecycle hooks. Essentially, we're able to specify uh, methods on our class that, we're able to, that the compiler is able to hook into and uh, invoke functions depending on the lifecycle of the component. So uh, for us, we're specifying, we're telling the compiler, I'm going to specify an on change hook. 
And down here, we're going to create this method on change, and then we're going to tell it to render uh, a rendering method. Now, this is very similar to dollar watch, where we're watching for changes, and then we're rendering uh, as such. Now, remember our interface that looks weird when it's zoomed in, how we have a bar graph, bind data, and everything? Well, in Angular 2, we have the exact same interface. In our top level component, we have application uh, app, and we have our bar graph, and we have bind data, the exact same thing as Angular 1. And we do this because we're using a, whoops, we're using, whoa, this other thing's going on. Uh, we're using an alternative syntax in Angular 2, um, but the, f the actual syntax that everyone knows and loves is the, the bracket notation. You know, everyone, this is the famous bracket notation that everyone knows. But for, for now, we can take advantage of the alternative syntax and use bind dash, right? And then similar to Angular 1, where we're attaching our data to the scope of our controller, uh, in Angular 2, we're doing the same thing, but in our constructor with graph data. And you can see that it matches one for one. And at the very end, we're also bootstrapping the app one for one. Um, in Angular 1, we're manually bootstrapping it. We're, say, we're specifying that the document um, should be bootstrapped with the application module. And now I'm going to talk about a few, a few steps you could take in order to uh, continue down this path of uh, migration from 1 to 2. So uh, we're going to take advantage of a few new features in, in Angular today. And that is, uh, rather than specifying a link, we could specify uh, a controller. Now, you would do this for uh, a few reasons, just because you want to be able to take advantage of the DI and inject attributes pretty much anywhere you want uh, and scope, similar to in Angular 2, where you can actually inject the attributes. So we're allowing the features set to be one for one again. Uh, and nothing else changes because it's the same thing. And um, in order to recreate this component, we could actually create uh, mimic the same design and create a, uh, a component in Angular 1. Now, uh, we could also take advantage of ES6 and use those features by creating a class. And um, you could see that it's pretty much the same as Angular 2, where we're specifying a directive, or in our case, a component. Uh, we're specifying the app and the selector. And over here, we're specifying the, the template, which is the view for the template. And then uh, down here, uh, graph data uh, to the graph data. And that's how we accomplish the same interface for Angular 1 and 2. Um, and that is our talk. Now, uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter. It's very important. And uh, if you have any questions about using this strategy for migration of Angular 1 and 2, feel, feel free to, to contact us uh, anytime during lunch or uh, later in the conference. All right. Thanks.